In this lecture, we're going to be having on our hat where we seek to explain sort of an empirical ground truth about algorithms. So specifically the fact that when you look at hash functions, uh, empirically they behave as well as if they were fully random functions, even though in the theoretical worst case that's not always true. So we're going to be seeking uh, some kind of theory uh, which explains why simple hash functions work so well in practice. And the solution we're going to put forth is similar to the spirit of smooth analysis. We're going to assume that uh, the data has at least a little bit of randomness in it. And under that assumption, we'll see that indeed simple universal hash functions are guaranteed to do as well uh, as uh, fully random hash functions. Okay? So just a little bit of, uh, you know, just jog your memory about hashing and the specific uh, motivating application of hashing I'm going to use, which you may not be familiar with, linear probing. So first, you know, just hash functions. So we're thinking about there being a, you know, big set, capital M, you know, maybe really, really big, maybe astronomically big, bigger than the number of items in the, atoms in the universe even. And uh, a hash function is responsible for basically compressing those. So given, giving each element of capital N a nickname that lies somewhere in capital M, okay? So this is what a hash function does. maps elements of capital M to elements of capital M, where capital M is much smaller. Again, depends on the application, but maybe today think of capital M as being like logarithmic in the size of capital N, for example. Okay. Now what else do I want you to remember? So because we're compressing, mapping a big set to a small set by the pigeonhole principle, inevitably there will be collisions. There'll be distinct elements of capital N that get mapped to the same element of capital M. Okay, and in your data structure, think of it as an array, say, where you have a bucket, you have to somehow deal with these collisions, right? So that's part of the implementation details of a hash table. Uh, one of the simpler ways, and usually what's emphasized in an undergraduate course, for example, is chaining. So this is where in each bucket you have a linked list. So everything that hashes to the same elements just gets concatenated to each other in a linked list in that bucket. That's not what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so we're going to be, uh, the motivating example is going to be a style of open addressing. So this is a different way of resolving collisions, where you maintain the invariant that in your hash table there's only going to be one item stored in each bucket. Okay? So clearly the load better be less than one. Okay, the number of things inserted better be at most the number of buckets, because there's only one per bucket. And so that means is when you hash something and you go, you go to put it in a bucket in a slot, if it's already full, you need to look elsewhere to find an empty slot to put this element that you're inserting. Okay? So there's many flavors of open addressing depending on how you search, how you do this search for an empty bucket. Okay? So you have to, formally speaking, define a probe sequence. So um, what I'm going to use as motivation is a particular probe sequence, a particular way of doing this search for an empty slot in a hash table called linear probing. Maybe the simplest thing you could think of. So if you're trying to, so you're given some element X in capital N and you apply your hash function H so that maps it to capital M, what do you do if that slot is full? You just search subsequent slots until you find an empty one. Okay, and you just dump it in the first empty slot that you find, wrapping around to the beginning of the array, the beginning of the hash table as needed. Okay. So start at a bucket h of x, and then you look at h of x plus 1, h of x plus 2, etc., cetera, uh, as needed to find an empty slot. Okay. So on an insertion, so think, think about the case where there's no deletions, okay? I don't want to deal with deletions. For an insertion, you just start at h of x and you just go forward until you find an empty slot and then that's where you put it. And then if you're doing a search, you start looking at h of x, you keep looking forward. If you ever find that element, obviously you're done and you return it. If you find an empty slot, then you can conclude that the element isn't there and it's an unsuccessful search, okay? So that's linear probing. So why do this and why not do this? What are the pros and cons? Um, so it's obviously simple. And uh, the main reason that this is useful in practice beyond simplicity is it uh, is primarily sequential accesses to a disk or to the data structure as opposed to random accesses, okay? So mostly sequential access. 
Okay, so I'm thinking here about you know a hash table which is an array just stored contiguously in memory. Okay, so that interacts well with the memory hierarchy. It interacts well with things like prefetching. So empirically, you often get quite good performance from linear probing, and it is fairly common in practice uh, for those reasons. Contrast that with, say, chaining, right? If you have a linked list, it can be hard to make sure that your linked list is contiguous in memory, so that might be jumping around in memory as you follow the linked list. Similarly, if you tried to do something more clever as a probing strategy that took you to and fro within the hash table, that again would be lots of random accesses, okay? All right, so, but what, are, what, what should one be concerned about with linear probing? Well, you know, intuitively, here's what you're sort of worried is going to happen. Right? So you start inserting things into your hash table randomly. And, uh, you know, for a while, when it's very sparse, you're not even going to have any collisions. Okay? So it's not a big deal. All right? And then maybe by chance, you know, just two things map into, say, adjacent buckets. And, but then, you know, there's sort of the, you're worried about this sort of amplification of clumps. Okay? So now, as soon as you have two things in a row, now all of a sudden, you know, there's a double the chance, right? So two out of the number of buckets that the next thing will go, will hit either of these. And whichever, you know, whichever of these attempted inserts you try to do, you're going to wind up, you know, searching forward and putting the new element here. Now all of a sudden there's three different slots where if you try to insert in any of these, it's going to wind up inserting something here, right? And then maybe even these things join, okay? So somehow, the bigger the blocks get, it feels like the more likely the blocks are to get even still bigger, okay? So intuitively, linear probing is vulnerable to clumps, all right? And obviously, the insertion time or the search time is degrading as you have these big clumps, okay? Because on average, you'll sort of find yourself somewhere in the middle as a starting point, and then you have to search through half of this clump, okay? So that's what you're worried about. That's why it's not actually so clear that the performance is going to be especially good for linear probing, okay? So, but there's, a, there's an old result uh, of my colleague, the living legend Don Knuth. I forget the exact date, it's something like 1960 or so, um, where he said, well, you know, let's ignore the details of what the hash function is, and let's just assume that actually the hash function is totally random. Okay, so that every time some new x shows up and you map, you look at h of x, let's assume that's uniform, not only is it a uniformly random bucket, but it's also independent of everything that's happened in the past. Okay, so that's a fully random function. Okay, since everything to a uniformly at random place independently. So under the best case scenario, of a fully random h, And again, fully random ind independent h of x's. Then it turns out the expected time of the teeth insertion is a function of the load only. Okay? So the exact function turns out to be basically 1 over 1 minus alpha, that's an alpha, alpha squared where here alpha denotes the load of the hash table, okay? It's not dependent on how the elements are distributed? Uh, well, so it's an expectation, okay. right? So there's always like the really unlucky case where, you know, they're all in a row. But so on average, over the randomness in the hash function, um, if the table say half full, so that corresponds to alpha being 0.5, then you're expecting to do basically four probes on the teeth insertion. So alpha here is t, the number of things you've inserted, over the number of buckets, the cardinality of n. Okay? And so the, the takeaway here is that, uh, you know, the reason this is so cool is it says, you know, basically you pick whatever, you know, expected insertion time you want. Okay? And in, you know, independent of how many insertions you're ever going to see, as long as you scale your hash table proportionally to the number of elements that you're going to have to hold, then you can control uh, the expected insertion time. Okay? So the point is, it depends on t only in as much as it depends on alpha. 
right? So obviously, you know, if you, if you want to store double the number of elements, you should expect to sort of double the hash table. But what's great here is that actually the performance remains unchanged as long as you scale the hash table with the number of insertions, okay? And that's sort of what you, you know, you'd love to have this to be even smaller, like one over one minus alpha, that would be even better. But to have this be a function of alpha only, otherwise independent of T and M is great, okay? So really just scale the hash table with the data set, you'll be fine. If it's totally random hash functions, okay? And I encourage you, uh, you know, to check out, if you look at Knuth's uh, Art of Computer Programming, Volume 3, he has a footnote where he basically says, you know, after he worked out this theorem, he found it, you know, he, he found the beauty so overwhelming, he had no choice but to devote the rest of his life to the analysis of algorithms. I'm not kidding. That's what he says, okay? So this seduced Knuth to basically work on this stuff for, for, for the rest of his life. Okay, um, so we're not going to prove this theorem. It's not... Uh, sort of outside the scope of this course. Uh, so what I want to talk about is I want to evaluate this hypothesis. Okay, so the best case scenario of a fully random hash function. All right. Now, in practice, hash functions are not fully random. Okay, you might want to think about what it would even mean okay, to use a, a completely random hash function, okay? Basically, it means you'd have to store it as a lookup table, okay, explicitly, all right? Which, you know, for any, you know, n of even moderate size is ridiculous, okay? So, it's really not an option, okay, to use fully random H's in interesting applications. So, we can't uh, use a truly random H. So this is false in practice, or the, the point is we're not using these, these hash functions. So then the question is, all right, is there some other way we can kind of justify the mathematics and Knuth's derivation? Okay, under what, uh, maybe there's alternative assumptions under which it would be true. This one over one minus alpha squared would be true. And so, you know, so for example, instead of having a totally random hash function, you could have just sort of any old, you know, hash function and assume that the data is totally random. Okay, that each thing you want to insert is sort of uniform at random from capital N and also independent from all the previous things you've wanted to insert. Okay? So the math would remain valid if you switched from thinking about a fully random hash function to fully random data sets. You can use any, any hash function you want. Uh, I mean, it should be, I mean, it, it's pretty easy to find hash functions that would be fine. The constant function would not be so good. So you need some mild uh, assumptions on the hash function. But many hash functions will do fine if the, if the data is totally random. Okay, so it's not hard to define a hash function that works well with random data. On the other hand, uh, you know, we kind of, uh, that it's not fully convincing. I and mean, that's good, it's good to have a second interpretation under which this is true, but you know, we don't really think data usually is kind of totally random and that everything being inserted is independent from what's being inserted before. It seems sort of implausible. Okay, so given that you know, we can't assume fully random hash functions nor fully random data, you know, sort of the hope is that uh, simple hash functions, namely ones that we can store explicitly in small space and ones that we can evaluate quickly, uh, work just as well, okay? So simple hash functions work just as well as fully random ones. So we want to just say, look, you know, th it's, this is true under the random function assumption, but that hypothesis is sort of overkill, okay? Just use sort of a small family of simple ones and, and you'll still get the same bound. That's what we'd love to be true, okay? So, all right, so we'll, fine, it's a nice idea. So how should we define simple hash functions? Okay, so it's a good definition. So, um, so in this lecture, we're just going to use what should be the definition you all already know from undergraduate algorithms and data structures, namely universal hashing. Okay? So that's the only uh, property of, of hash functions we'll be using. So recall, so that if you have a set, a family, H, of hash functions, okay, all of these mapping the same domain N to the same range, capital M, We call this universal if what? So we want to think about collisions, right? So collisions are important. So we say think about an arbitrary pair of distinct elements in the domain, okay? So for all x, y, and n, distinct. And we talk about the probability, and this is over the choice of h, 
Okay, so x and y are fixed and different. We're picking a random hash function. Or put differently, we're looking at the fraction of hash functions in this family under which these two elements collide. So again, x and y are not random. H is what's random in here. All right, so collisions are bad, so presumably we want an upper bound in this probability. Now, what kind of upper bound would we be happy with? Well, suppose actually h was a totally random function. Okay, so suppose every h of x, h of y, h of z was chosen independently and uniformly at random. What would this probability be? One over the size of the range. Right, one over the size of the range. So I'm calling capital M the range. Why would that be true? Well, just, you know, first you pick h of x. It goes wherever it goes. Slot number 17. Okay? h of y is independent of that and uniformly at random, and so there's a, you know, 1 in m chance that it goes to slot 17 as opposed to some other one. So univer universal hash functions just says, for the purposes of a pair of elements, x and y, the collision probability is as low as the gold standard set forth by fully random hash functions. Okay? That's what universal hash function, uh, universal hashing means. All right? Now, fully random functions have properties other than this one, right? So, for example, if we look to the probability that three elements collide, then we'd get a 1 over m squared here, and I'm not asking for that. But I'm saying if you just look at pairs of elements, then it should be the random type collision probability. Okay, so sometimes this is called too universal, because it's about pairs of elements. Okay, so you should have seen this definition before. What's the intuition about why this risk class is the right definition? A good definition? Yeah, so I mean, collisions are bad. You want collisions to be unlikely. And so this is saying collisions is as unlikely as random hashing. Yeah, but this is, um, so how much looser is this than like saying that it's a perfect hash function? Well, if you're just focusing on pairwise collisions, it's exactly the same as saying it's a random hash function. But if you look at like three, three elements or four elements, it could be significant. Then there's no guarantee. Okay. So you should know this definition, I hope. And what else should you know? So you should know that there are plenty of constructions of small families, small script H's. So in other words, hash functions that can be stored in small space, for which you can also evaluate the function, little h, on any domain element x quickly. So for example, the one I usually teach in undergrad algorithms is the one where you take a domain element, like an x, you break it into small blocks, and then you take a random linear combination of the blocks of x. Okay? So you just pick coefficients in a linear combination at random, and then you take that modulo a prime. Okay? That's a universal family of hash functions. I'm not going to prove that now. I'm just saying that orally, hopefully to remind you, but also just to give you kind of a verbal proof that it's not hard to come up with functions that satisfy this property. Okay? Simple classes of functions satisfy this property. All right? So and that's, I mean, there are, other, there are even simpler hash functions that don't satisfy this definition, but I'm just saying it's not unreasonable to take for, especially for the purpose of proving a theorem, a simple hash function, we're going to take this as the definition. Okay? It's kind of more or less the minimal property under which you could hope any theorems would be provable under any kind of, uh, you know, reasonable assumptions. Okay? All right, so that's one thing you should know um, about these uh, families as they do exist, and they're small ones, and they're practical, one, practical ones. Uh, another thing another th uh, that you might have seen is that actually this property alone is sufficient to justify the performance of chaining. Okay, so remember chaining is where you have a hash table and you have a linked list in each bucket, and you can talk about things like, you know, what's the expected, say, unsuccessful search time in a hash table with chaining. Okay? And it turns out, if you tell me nothing about the hash functions that you're using, other than that the hash function was chosen at random from a universal family, that alone is enough to argue that as long as the hash function has constant load, the expected unsuccessful search time is constant. Okay? So universality guarantees constant operation time in hash tables with chaining with constant load. Okay? And again, the order of, don't forget the order of quantifiers here when you talk about hashing. You think about the data set being worst case and fixed up front, and then you think about picking a random hash function from a family for this worst case data set. Okay? That's the usual quantifiers when you're talking about universal hashing. Okay? So, for chaining, you don't need anything more than this assumption. Okay? But it turns out the plot thickens for some open addressing strategies, and in particular for linear probing. So what would be great, so again, so to summarize, for chaining, 
Universal simple hash functions in this sense are as good for the performance metrics that we care about as fully random hash functions. So we'd love to just say exactly the same thing for linear probing. Don't use a random hash function, just use a universal hash function and you still get the one over one minus alpha squared upper bound on expected search and insertion time. However, not that long ago, just maybe a little over five years ago, we have the following result. The point of this result says that conclusion for chaining is not true for linear probing. If all you tell me is that your hash functions are universal, then it is not the case that you get an upper bound. Forget about 1 over 1 minus alpha squared. You don't get any bound that depends only on the load alpha. So formally, there exists a sequence of ever, you know, we're going to let the uh, range grow larger and larger. So there exist universal families, script H of hash functions, and worst case data sets. You know, meaning things to be inserted into the hash table under a random hash function from this family of arbitrarily large size, such that the expected time of the teeth insertion grows with t even as the load stays fixed. Okay. So despite alpha t over m staying constant. Okay, so I'm being a little sloppy with the way I'm writing this. Okay, so really what this means is there's a sequence, okay, of domain and ranges, capital N's and capital M's, and they're get growing, going to infinity, okay? Also going to infinity is, so M's going to infinity, so the hash table size is going to infinity. So is the number of items that we're inserting, okay? And they're going to infinity at the same rate, okay? And their ratio is alpha, and that stays fixed, okay? As T goes to infinity, despite the fact the load is constant, uh, the expected time of the teeth insertion is also going to infinity. In other words, the expected insertion time cannot be bounded above as a function purely of the load alpha. It also depends on the size of the data set. Okay? And that's different than what we have for linear probing for fully random hash functions. It's also different from what we have for chaining for just uh, universal hash functions. Okay? Oh, yeah. Is this the time where you can apply the like, smooth analysis to kind of get rid of this? Yeah, so that's sort of the spirit of this lecture. Okay, so it's not, so smooth analysis per se, it's not totally clear what that means. Okay, because for smooth analysis, at least as the way we've been talking about it, and everyone else talks about it, there's numbers. And you add these small perturbations to numbers. Right, everything with hashing is fully abstract. Right, there's just an abstract set N, an abstract set M. So one way to interpret this lecture is what would, what would it mean to analyze hashing in the spirit of smooth analysis? And so I'm going to give you what I think is a satisfying answer to that question. Yeah, so it's not an accident that this lecture is adjacent to the smooth analysis ones. Very much in the same spirit. Okay, other questions? Is it constructive proof? Yes. I even was tempted to put it on homework, and I may uh, torture some future year of this class with that, yeah. It's not, you know, it's, it's just like a little too long for, for a problem on a problem set. But it's close. You know, it, I'd probably have to give it like 50 points over all of the parts or something <laughs> if I put it on the problem set. And you've seen some 40 pointers, so. I still might do it sometime. But anyways, I encourage you to read it if you're interested. It's, you know, it's just roughly about a page of a, of a journal paper, maybe a page and a half. Okay, um, so what do we want? So empirically, I should say, Empirically, this does not happen. And I guess this is the other point. I mean, this is the other, uh, all right, so if empirically we also saw this, then we wouldn't expect some kind of smooth analysis to help us, right? So the other sort of trigger that, you know, should give you that, you know, what El you know the same response Elliot just had is you want to see a gap between what the worst case theory predicts and what you actually observe for real data. But that is the case here. So empirically, universal hash functions as good as random. So almost no difference uh, in many different senses for many different domains, okay? 
So pretty, pretty robust uh, empirical conclusion. So what do we think might be going on? Well, it's reasonable to draw the following cartoon and wonder if there could be a theorem that corresponds to the following cartoon. So we've got our universal, not perfectly random, but universal hash function. And that's mapping the buckets. Right, so this is capital M. And we're observing that this is essentially uniform. Okay? And not just you know, uniform each time you insert something, but also just if you look at the whole joint distribution over everything inserted, even that's uniform. So you're even observing independence, roughly, between the different things you're inserting. So this isn't true in general, right? So in particular, you know, this says that you know, the distribution induced by universal families is not close to uniform. Right? If it was close to uniform, then we would inherit the one over one minus alpha squared. Okay, so the distribution looks different, and it's popping up here in a different expected search time. But that's for a worst case data set. And so especially coming from sort of the smooth analysis lectures, maybe we just have sort of mildly random Again, we don't want to assume fully random data. One, we don't believe it. And two, we're sort of hoping it's overkill mathematically. But maybe we have mildly random data. And if you feed that into a universal hash function, maybe that's enough to explain the empirical observation that you basically have a uniform distribution over the buckets. Okay? So that's kind of the cartoon that we're hoping for. We're missing a little randomness in the hash function, but maybe that can be compensated for with a little bit of randomness we'd expect in real world data. All right? Okay, so that's the target theorem. Right? So the target theorem says sufficiently random data, which of course we have to define, again, you know, because they're not numbers, we don't, it's not clear what it means to, to have a perturbations. Sufficiently random data and an arbitrary universal hash function uh, gives us performance as good as totally random hash functions. Okay? So that's actually true in a very, I think, uh, interpretable and satisfying sense. All right, so, before we're in a position to prove any theorems, we've got a couple of missing definitions, okay? So the first, the, sort of the simpler definition that I do want to be precise about is what does it mean to say a distribution is kind of squiggly uniform, okay? That's the first thing. The other thing which I obviously need to define is mildly random data, okay? So I'm going to do those in turn. All right, so how should we define squiggle? for distributions. Well, actually, there's a zillion different ways to do this, okay? But if you think about sort of what we're, what, so what are we trying to accomplish, right? What are we trying to say? We're basically trying to say, it's like, look, we're basically trying to justify any analysis out there for hashing, which has made the assumption that things are fully random. So you wanna say, look, do your analysis for the fully random case, and we want to say it'll translate automatically to slightly random data and universal hashing. Okay? And, we, and we don't really wanna know even what kind of analysis you're doing. Just whatever you do with fully random hash functions is gonna be fine. So that motivates the following definition. Basically that, you know, if you look at two distributions, any event should have essentially the same probability under either distribution. Okay? Because again, we don't, I don't want to, I don't want to know what events you care about for your downstream analysis. Okay? So that's going to be this assumption, or this definition. So distributions D1 and D2. And let me just say now, in this lecture, It'll always be the case that one of these is uniform on some set, and the other one is almost uniform. That's going to be the only case we ever care about. So distribution Z1 and D2 uh, on the same set, say omega, are epsilon close if, for every single event, and we're going to go ahead and think of omega as finite, just because that's all we need. Um, the probability under one distribution is the same as the probability under the other distribution up to plus minus epsilon. Okay. So the difference in the probability is assigned by the two distributions to any one event is at most epsilon. Okay. So in other words, whatever events you care about and you've bounded under the fully random assumption, the same thing is true uh, under other assumptions up to an epsilon. Okay. So this is what the squiggle means. All right. Now, uh, so I've stated the definition in the form where I think it's clearest that this is what you want, given why we're proving this theorem. 
okay, which is to go back and forth between the fully random case and universal case. Let me actually restate it, or rather explain to you how you're going to prove it can be restated in a way that's easier for the proof. Okay, it turns out this is basically just the same as an L1 distance between these two distributions. Okay? So this is not hard, I'll ask you to prove it on the homework, which is that two distributions are epsilon close if viewing them as vectors over omega, Okay, so think of it, so remember, think of omega as finite, finite. We only care about the finite case today. So then, you know, what's a distribution? It's just how much probability it assigns to each, you know, element in the finite set. So you can think of distribution as a vector indexed by omega, okay? Given two vectors, you can talk about their distance under various norms, like the L1 norm, okay? Epsilon close just means that in the L1 norm, uh, the two distributions are at most two epsilon apart, okay? And that's actually if and only if, all right? Uh, it's pretty easy to prove. Basically, the key insight is that, what is this saying? You know, this is basically saying, even for a worst case event, okay, so, so because it's for all s, even if an adversary chooses the s to make the probability between these distributions as big as possible, even then it differs by at most epsilon. Well, if you are the adversary, if you think about it, it's actually pretty clear which s you're going to do to maximize this probability distinction. You're just going to look element by element omega, and you're going to say, oh, well, let's look at exactly the ones where D1 puts more mass on it than D2. And I'm going to collect all of those into an event. And that's sort of the worst case discrepancy between these two distributions. And actually, that's just half of the L1 norm, if you think about it, because the two distributions sum to the same thing. But I'll let you work that out on the homework, okay? But that, I mean, the point is the proof is short. Sorry, there should be a one there. All right? So this is, this is the conceptual point of the definition, and then this is the mathematical version of it that we're actually going to prove. Okay, we're going to show that you know, random hash functions, those correspond to some distribution. Mildly random data plus universal hash function corresponds to some other distribution, and then the L1 norm between those two distributions viewed as vectors is small. Any questions? Okay. On to the next. Definition. What would it mean for data to be mildly random? Okay. So consider a random variable with some range. Again, we may as well think of it as, as a finite range for our purposes. For example, R could be buckets. Now, the first idea is actually, even though there's no perturbations, if you think about the version of smooth analysis, the type of perturbations we were using the past few lectures, actually that definition does make sense, even totally abstractly with what we're talking about now. What was the definition? The definition was the distribution shouldn't be too spiky. We were there thinking about sort of continuous numbers, so we're talking about the density function being bounded above at every single point. You know, now we have this finite case, so we have like a probability mass on each element. We can again say not too spiky. Nowhere in omega, I guess nowhere in R can the probability assigned to R be too large. Okay? That's totally analogous to this density upper bound we had the last three lectures. So that's a natural first idea. <coughs> so the biggest probability, so the biggest spike that you ever see assigned to a particular range element that X could take on is at most some delta. Okay? Delta here is a parameter. So the smaller delta is, the more random, the more diffuse this random variable capital X. Okay? Actually, this is a totally fine definition. It turns out we're going to use a different definition, not because there's anything really wrong with this one, but just because we'll use a definition which is even weaker, and it's no harder to work with, so we'll just get stronger results. Okay? But there's, again, nothing wrong with this definition. This is a good definition. So here's what we're going to do instead. Idea number two, instead of assuming this, we're going to say, well, consider this random variable X, capital X, and suppose you instantiated it twice, okay? So you have two copies, independent, same distribution. You know, once in a while, both of the copies will take on the same value, okay? So this is like, right, well, it is what it is. Sometimes it's not, sometimes you get different values. So we're, instead of saying the maximum probability, it's going to be a most delta. We're going to say the probability that two independent copies of x take on the same value is a most delta. Okay. So formally, we look at all the values that x could take on. 
And we say, well, the probability that both copies of the random variable take on that value is just the probability that one copy takes it on squared, because they're independent copies. And we're going to think about that being bounded above by delta. Okay. So take 30 seconds to convince yourself that if the first, sorry, uh, if the first condition holds, then the second condition holds for the same value of delta. Okay, so just stare at it and convince yourself that that's true. So this is called the collision probability. Okay, again, because it's the probability that two independent copies collide, i.e. have the same value. Uh, so why is that true? Well, so suppose this holds. So suppose every single probability of x equal i is bounded above by delta. Okay? Think of this as, that means, so, you know, break this into two independent copies of itself. So you take the first copy, you can bound every one of those by delta. You bring delta out in front of the sum, you're left with a sum over i, the probability that x takes on the value i. So distribution says it's equal to 1, so that gives you delta. Okay? So when this condition holds, this condition holds as well. Okay? So this is a weaker assumption. So if we prove positive results under this assumption, it's better. Okay? It's more sweeping positive results, and that's what we're going to do. Okay? Andy? This is kind of like the max norm versus the L2 norm, right? Isn't it like the max norm is always bigger? Uh, let's see. So the, the max norm is always going to be smaller than the L2 norm. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's on, you know, at some level, it's the same kind of stuff. I mean, it's, there's different ways to take vectors and squeeze them down into numbers. And, you know, some are bigger than others, and usually you can control how much bigger one can be than the rest. So, okay. So this is going to be our definition of sort of a single data element. Okay, I owe you, I owe you, I, I owe you a more full-blown definition, but this is, this is really, this is important. Okay, the rest is kind of falls easily from this. So think of this as like a single data element, okay? Uh, our definition of being sufficiently random is that the collision probability is not too big, okay? So just to get a better, okay, yeah, so just some more examples to get a better feel for this. Okay, so when would these be different? Okay, so I argued that whenever this is a most delta, this is a most delta. So let's see that the converse is not true. Okay, just develop your intuition further. Imagine you had a random variable capital X. So suppose you had like a really big range. So, you know, the range was huge. And maybe like half the time, okay, X took on the value 1. And then the other 50% of the time is uniformly distributed across like a million different outcomes. Okay? Well, then it's pretty obvious that this number is a half, right? because it takes on this one probability of probability half. On the other hand, this is going to be like a quarter. Okay? Because now both copies have to take on the value 1 for them to collide. In principle, they could collide on one of these other outcomes, but it's super unlikely. It's not going to happen. Okay? So that shows that indeed the collision probability can be uh, considerably smaller than the highest of the probability masses. Okay, and now, but at the same time, I encourage you to keep in mind sort of a canonical random variable capital X, a canonical sort of data element uh, where these happen to be the same. Okay, there's actually no difference between the two. So for example, X uniform over a subset uh, you know, subset S of some size K. Uh, I believe so. I think so, yeah. So, and I guess just to connect this to the other notation I'm using, think of, in fact, I probably even should have done this. Basically, think of R as being equal to capital N. What was capital N? That was the domain of what we were hashing. Okay? So X is like some random, you know, IP address or some random news article or whatever it is we're hashing into a hash table. Okay? And so, um, you know, and worst case, it could be any element of capital N. Now we're trying to say it's sort of sufficiently random in some sense. So one way you can think about being sufficiently random is you're like, well, 
maybe an adversary first picks a set of size capital K, and then nature picks like something uniform at random from capital K. Now, if capital K has size one, then it's not random at all, right? So then the adversary just picks whatever element it wants, and it's worst case. But as the adversary is forced to pick a bigger and bigger set K, and then nature picks randomly from it, then this element is more and more random, okay? And indeed, if X is uniform at random over a set of size K, then this delta is going to be exactly one over K, okay, in both cases. Okay, so the bigger the, the, bigger the you know, secret subset from which it's drawn, the smaller the value of this delta. All right? And again, sort of you know, a slightly cartoonish version, you might want to think about this assumption is, we're going to do the analysis, it's like, you know, we're going to assume that we know that the adversary had to pick a sufficiently big set, sufficiently big set S, we just don't know what it was. So we want to basically say no matter which set S the adversary picked from which nature then draws a uniformly random element, it doesn't matter which it is, hashing will do great, okay? And again, keep in mind, you know, capital N is huge, right? Again, like all IP addresses or kind of like all news articles or something like that. So there's zillions and zillions of different choices of, you know, a secret set S from which, you know, nature could be picking something. So there's a zillion different distributions we're trying to argue a single hash function is handling all at once. Right, that's sort of the power of this, the power of this approach. All right. Anyways, so if I lost you, just you know, the key points here are: this is our definition of a given data element being sufficiently random. The collision probability is sufficiently small. Okay, we dealt as a parameter. We'll talk more about it in a second. Canonically, think of this data element as you know, there's first some very small subset of capital N, and then it's drawn uniformly at random from that. Okay, questions. All right, so of course, we're not just inserting one thing into a hash table. We're inserting a bunch of things into a hash table. So I need to somehow extend this notion of a single data element, a single element uh, from capital N being sufficiently random to a whole data set. And so that's done in a reasonably natural way. And then this is going to be our final definition of su uh, sufficiently random data set. And so this is called a block source. It's not important that you know this, but just for completeness, a block source with entropy K. Uh, this is by definition a sequence of random variables with range N. And so again, you want to think of this as being the uh, slightly random elements that are going to get inserted into a hash table. That's the point here. Um, is a sequence with what property? Such that, basically, you know, whenever you're about to insert something, what you're about to insert is a little bit random in the sense of having small collision probability. And moreover, it's random even, you know, conditioned on the stuff you already inserted. Okay, so you already inserted a bunch of stuff and you want to make sure that even knowing what the previous part of the sequence is, you still have sufficient randomness left in what you're about to insert now, okay? So for all i, so for everything you insert, conditioned on the previous stuff, conditioned arbitrarily on x1 up to xi minus 1, the collision probability, so again remember this is just the sum of these squares, collision probability of xi conditioned on this stuff is at most 1 over to the little k. Okay, so this is a, this is a little k. I'm going to stop using little k's. I'm only going to use big k's, and big k is this. Okay, which is the same notation I was using for big k over with the uh, uniform over subsets. Okay. So again, collision probability at most one over k. So weaker than, but you could, you know, for the lecture, think of it as being roughly equivalent to uh, the probability that it takes on any given value is at most 1 over capital K. Okay. All right. So any questions about that? Seem reasonable? Because does everyone understand it mathematically, the definition? That's the most important thing. All right. Okay. So this is, this is the final definition. Okay. So now given this definition, we can actually prove the theorem we want. 
So let me erase the cartoon and replace it with the formal version. So the theorem, which is from 08, Mitzenmacher, Badan, says that um, let x1 to xt be a block source with entropy k, be as above. Let h be universal, no other assumptions. Then, the joint distribution of the hash function as well as the buckets to which that hash function maps all of these elements is essentially the uniform distribution. So again, essentially that's the squiggle, so this should be something close. I'm going to write down a slightly complicated expression here. Immediately after finishing the theorem, I'll help you interpret this expression. So before I do that, though, let's just make sure we're type checking everything. So I'm claiming the joint distribution of this stuff. Again, what is this stuff? This is the hash function. The hash function is chosen uniformly at random from, from, from universal family script H. X1 through XT, this is what's being inserted into the hash table under this randomly chosen hash function. These, by assumption, are also random. Okay, so there's randomness in H, there's randomness in the XIs. This vector, this is the hash function, these are the buckets to which the data elements land. Okay, so the XIs lie in capital N, the H of the XIs lie in capital M. So when I say close to the uniform distribution, uniform distribution on what? Well, the first component, this is just a member of the hash function family. So that's a script H. Each of these is a bucket. So each of these is an element of capital M, and there's T of them. Okay, so times M, the set M, product T fold times. Okay? So this is the relevant uniform distribution to which to compare this. Clear? Okay. All right. So, so hopefully you can at least to some degree syntactically match what this says to the cartoon we just had. We wanted to say sufficiently random data plus universal hashing gets us essentially uni you know, random, you know, fully random functions. So here's the sufficiently random data. Clearly it's a universal hash function, and we know closeness has something, you know, is the swirl to the uniform distribution. Now, what do the parameters have to be for this to be meaningful, okay? So it turns out, actually, this is good, but it takes a little bit of thought to figure out why this is good. Let's just make sure you remember what everything is. So T, this is how many things are being inserted into the hash table, okay? We're talking about linear probing. All right, so M is the number of buckets, slots. We're talking about an open addressing hash table. So there's going to be at most one element inserted per slot. Okay? So T is at most M for sure. So think actually of T equal to M. That's sort of the worst case. Okay? So just make those the same. Now K, this measures how much randomness there is in the input. So the bigger K is, the more random the input, the smaller this is, which makes sense. The closer we are to uniform, the bigger K is, the more random the input. So the question, the reason we want some really precise formula is we really want to know how much randomness is necessary in the data to get epsilon close to uniform, okay? And then there's going to be some functional form saying how big K has to be as a function of epsilon. Okay, so to interpret, so to get epsilon close, so now you, just, now you just solve. You just set this equal to epsilon and you just solve. And what you get is that you need k to be at least mt squared over 4 epsilon squared. Okay? And again, think of t as just equal to m. Okay? So you get an m cubed here. All right? I.e., if you take logs, So remember, we have this notion of entropy, so this is just, um, so log of this is the entropy in the data. So i.e. log k is at least basically 3 log m, again, I'm setting t equal to m, 
3 log m plus lower order terms, so plus stuff. Okay, so think of epsilon as some constant small, like 0 0.01, 0 0.1 or 0 0.01, all right? So how should you interpret this? Let me give you two ways to, to interpret this, right? So remember, capital M is the number of buckets, and we want to be sort of uniform over the buckets. So if you look at the red expression, you sort of think, well, you know, certainly we're going to need like log M bits of randomness to spit out anything which is uniform over M things, right, over M buckets, right? So if you think about it, log M is sort of an obvious lower bound on the entropy required to expect anything to be close to a uniform distribution, right? So what we're saying is basically the, the amount of randomness necessary is only triple the number of bits that's the sort of clearly a lower bound on what's required. So that's the first inkling that we're doing pretty well, actually. Okay, so we're within a constant of some natural lower bound. Here's another way to think about it. So remember, I encourage you to think about, you know, capital X, these data elements. One, another way to think about how we're parameterizing the randomness is the adversary picks sort of a secret set and the nature picks something uniform from it. Okay? But again, the whole problem is, you know, our hash function is independent of the secret set chosen by the adversary. Right? So we're just picking a random hash function. We're hoping that no matter what secret set the adversary picks, so it's like a slightly random, you know, random variable, it gets smoothed out automatically to be uniform over the buckets. Okay? And remember, capital N is huge, capital M is small. Okay? And so what this says is that if we just force the adversary to pick uniformly from a set of size at least m cubed, and again, think of like n as exponential in m. Okay, m is the number of buckets, that's maybe like a million. You know, n is maybe like all possible, you know, texts of 500 characters, it's something astronomical. So, we're, so there's a zillion different things that this subset of size k could be, but it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it has size at least m cubed, our hash function is gonna automatically smooth us out and give us a distribution uniformly over the buckets. Okay, so those are a couple different ways to interpret this theorem and senses in which we're doing pretty well. Okay. This is a theoretical lower bound of log m. Yeah, there is, yeah. At least for the way I've stated this, yeah. So the notes include some references. So I'm not gonna go into this. So you can ask, you know, can this be improved, right? So it's fine, okay, so it's, it's reasonable. That's what, I, that's what I've tried to argue. And it can be improved a little bit. It's also known it can't be improved a lot, okay? And I'm not gonna say more about either of those two statements. The notes have some references about where you can read more, okay? So it's not the absolute optimal, but it's, you know, I think of this as enough to really give a convincing explanation of good empirical performance in lots of different applications, which is kind of what I wanted. Okay. One other sort of clarifying point just about this theorem statement. One thing you may be thinking is, you might, you know, if you've been paying close attention, you might think it's a little weird. You know, which is that uh, the statement I've written down is maybe a little bit different than what you would have thought. If you think about it, what really we care about is this stuff. Right, so when we say, you know, stuff's getting hashed just as good as if it was a fully random hash function, we're always saying, well, you know, if you look at the buckets to which everybody goes to, they're both uniform and they're also all independent of each other. Right, so that's really just talking about the joint distribution on the buckets to which everything gets hashed. And I also just sort of threw in and said, oh, well, even sort of the hash function here, even this bigger joint distribution is uniformly at random. Okay, so that's, I mean, this is a stronger statement, so it shouldn't bother you too much. And it turns out to prove the theorem, it's really a lot nicer to have the stronger statement for an inductive hypothesis. Okay, and because you're proving it on the homework, uh, the inductive step anyways, that's, that's one reason you wanna, you wanna have this here. Okay. okay, good. So that's the main result and how to interpret it. Okay, so that's how we translate the cartoon of sufficiently random data namely a block source uh, with entropy uh, at least log of this amount plus universal hash functions no matter what they are gets you epsilon close to uniform okay so any questions about that before i talk about the proof okay all right so the proof is basically, uh, I mean, this, um, this follows almost immediately, actually, even though this is a paper from 08, it, it follows almost immediately from a result in 89. And it just took um, a lot of time for anyone to realize that developments uh, going on in what's called pseudorandomness were relevant for the analysis of hashing, okay? Uh, so the key tool is a well-known result from 
theoretical cryptography called the leftover hash lemma. This is due to Pagliazzo, Levin, and Luby in 89. And uh, what this is, this is simply this statement for the special case where t equals 1. Okay? So in other words, what the leftover hash lemma says, it says suppose you have a single random variable with low collision probability. Okay, collision probability at most 1 over capital K. That's the hypothesis. The other hypothesis, assume that you have this randomly drawn hash function from a universal family. Then the joint distribution on the hash function and the hash value of the data element X is, T is now 1, is one half times root m over k close to the uniform distribution on now it's the hash functions times one copy of m. Okay, so that's exactly the leftover hash level. All right, and so I'll prove this to you. I prove I will prove to you the leftover hash lemma. and um, in homework number eight, I'll ask you to extend to the general case by induction. All right, and you'll notice, I mean, as you extend it by induction, you do lose something in the uh, closeness parameter. Okay, so you're having linear loss in capital T in the closeness parameter. Uh, it's not a trivial induction. It's actually a pretty tricky induction, okay? But I'm gonna ask you to think about that on the homework, all right? The original motivation of the leftover hash lemma, so basically, the reason they cared about something like this, they were thinking where you, had a, you have a secret key, okay, like 32 bits or whatever, uh, chosen totally uniformly at random, okay? And it's great, because you can foil all these adversaries because they can't guess your secret key. But then, at some point, you have an inkling that it's been compromised. So an adversary has figured out eight bits of your secret key, but you don't know which of the eight. And so the question is, you have to throw it out and just sort of redo a totally new uh, secret key? Or can you actually extract, despite the fact you don't know which 24 bits are still good, can you somehow extract 24 close to that bits of randomness from it? And so basically this lemma was saying, yeah, use a universal hash function, apply it to the partially compromised key, and you're going to get an uncompromised, perfectly random, although shorter key, commensurate with the number of bits that the adversary hasn't seen. Okay. So that was, the original, that was the original point. So here's the proof. The proof, I mean, it's really just kind of calculations, but it's a, very, it's a very slick and almost sort of pretty arrangement of calculations. So let me show them to you. First, an overview. So the first thing, and really this is the main step, is we're going, no, okay, so what are we trying to prove? So remember, we're proving this with t equal one. The conclusion says we have to say, we have to say that something's close to uniform, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna do this in three steps. So the first thing we're gonna, we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, you know, I'm not gonna promise anything about whether it's close to uniform or not, but at least for starters, I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue that the collision probability of the distribution is small, okay? So we're going to bound the collision probability of the joint distribution of the random hash function and the hash value of this element, okay? And this is where we use all of our hypotheses. So we use the fact that this is random and universal. And we use the fact that X itself has low collision probability. Okay, so remember that's the hypothesis. This data element has low collision probability. And we're saying that together with the universality implies that this distribution also has low collision probability. So that's sort of the main step. But it's not really you know, what the theorem states. The theorem asserts closeness to a uniform distribution. Okay, so we know that if you think about it, or it's easy to, easy to see, if you have something that is a uniform distribution, then its collision probability is really small. So it's now we have to reverse that. We have to show some kind of converse, saying the only way you can have low collision probability is by being close to uniform. Okay? So that's steps two and three. So two, so first we're gonna apply closeness to uniform in the L2 norm, and then it will be easy to go to the L1 norm. And recall from early in the lecture that this, the closeness that we care about is the same as just saying small L1 norm, okay? So then it applies epsilon close, to uniform. 
Any, qu any questions? <coughs> okay. So. On to step one. So let's look at the joint distribution that we care about and let's compute its collision probability. Okay? So let's just, again, let's just make sure we understand exactly what is this distribution. We pick a hash function, capital H, uniformly random from script H. We instantiate our random data element, capital X, and we apply H to X. Okay? So the first component is just the hash function. The second component is an element of capital M. Right? So X is an element of capital N. H of X is an element of capital M. All right? And so that's the, that's the random variable we're looking at. Remember that the collision probability is defined as you take two independent copies of the random variable and you see if they're exactly the same. Okay, so remember one copy of a random variable here is a hash function and the hash value of an element. Okay, so that pair is one IID sample. We're going to look at two IID samples of that type and ask when are they exactly the same. So, by definition, a collision probability We take two copies of this random variable, okay? And we say, when are they the same? So probability, we have H, H prime. These are drawn uniformly from capital H. We take two copies of capital X. They both lie in capital N, and this from whatever distribution governs capital X. And we want to know what's the probability that h, h of x equals h prime, h prime of x prime. Okay? This is the definition, this is one of the definitions of the collision probability. We want to upper bound this, we want to say it's small, close to zero. We've got a few things going for us. We've got the fact that x has a distribution with low collision probability. We have the fact that h is universal. Okay, so first of all, for this, to equal this, it better be at least be the case, a necessary condition is that the first components match. Okay? H and H prime better be the same function in our two draws. Okay? So, probability that H equals H prime times probability that uh, the second components are the same, given that the first components are the same. All right. So, this first term is not hard to understand. H and H prime are both chosen at random from script H. So what's the probability they wind up being exactly the same thing? One over the magnitude of H. One over the cardinality of H. Just the usual closing probability for a uniform distribution. Okay. Good. So now let's zoom in on this. Okay, and now things are a little bit more interesting, right? So now we say, okay, given that H equals H prime, okay, so I'm still writing H and H prime separately, but these are really the same function now. That's what we've conditioned on. So this could really, these could be the same thing for two different reasons. Okay? So first of all, I might get really unlucky and just actually also choose x and x prime to be exactly the same. Could happen. Or maybe I, I choose x and x prime to be different, but they happen to collide under this chosen hash function, h. Okay? So that gives us two cases. All right? So zooming in on this, so first let's just say, well, you know, if x equals x prime, the game's over. And then on the other hand, if x and x prime are different, so now I'm conditioning both on h equal h prime and x not equal to x prime, right, that's case two, there's still some probability that h of x equals h prime of x prime. So let's try to understand these. So, uh, first of all, how about this? 
So the first thing to notice is, you know, H and X are drawn independently, right? So this is irrelevant. Condition's totally irrelevant, right? So it's just the probability that these two copies, these two instantiations of the random variable capital X are the same, also known as the collision probability of the distribution from which X is drawn, okay? And so by assumption, uh, this is at most one over K, all right? So that's where we've used, okay, so, what, so let's track the assumptions as we use them. Here the only assumption we're using is that H is drawn uniformly at random from script H. We're not even using that it's universal, doesn't matter. Here we're explicitly using our sufficiently random data assumption, okay? The fact that it has low collision probability. Let's look at the second term. We're now conditioning on the fact that H and H prime are equal. Okay, we don't know what they are, they're random, but they're the same. And we're conditioning on the fact that x and x prime are different, okay? So now further fix, ex fix a value for x and x prime, distinct, okay? Now, what is this? And again, remember, h equals h prime, that's the condition. Well, so h is drawn uniformly at random from script h, and h is universal, okay? So whatever x and x prime are, just by virtue of being distinct, we know that this collision probability by universality is at most as large as random hashing, i.e. one over capital M, okay? So this is at most one over capital M by universality, okay? How did we get the one over K? I thought we bounded the collision probability by delta earlier. So delta was just a parameter. And uh, so if you, if you call the definition of a block source, I mean, it, it's the same. So delta and K are just re, you know, different definitions, basically. Or different sort of uh, names for the same parameter. So I guess what I was calling delta at one point, I'm now calling one over capital K. Okay, so what did we just prove? Let's, uh, so when the dust settles, what do we get? So, we conclude that the collision probability of H, H of X is bounded above. So don't forget we have this leading one over script H. And then we have parentheses one over K plus one over cardinality of M. All right, so that's what we just proved. Okay, so that's step one. Okay, and we've used all our hypotheses. So now it's just a little bit of algebra from here on out. Let's just, I mean, just, uh, you know, to, to get a um, sort of for morale, let's just try to sort of measure how well we're doing, okay? So, like, like, is it, like, what is this? Is this a big number or a small number? I mean, they're all reciprocals. I guess that's good. Can't be too big, maybe. Uh, but what are we trying to do? We're trying to, we're trying to prove that it's close to uniform. So let's actually ask ourselves, what if it really was uniform? What collision probability would we be getting instead? Okay, well, don't forget, uniform over what? Okay, so the, rel the relevant space here, the first component's a hash function, the second component's a bucket, okay? So we're trying to prove close to uniform on this set. Collision probability on this set is just one over the cardinality. This is the computation we've been doing over and over again. So if it was totally uniform, we'd have the same thing just with no k, okay? So we're just picking up this one over k. So it's worse, but you gotta believe that, you know, like if one over k was sort of not, you know, quite a bit smaller than one over m, you'd sort of hope we'd be fine. And it's true, we just have to be honest and do the computations to prove it, okay? Okay, so that's step one. So now let's, now we need to go from low collision probability and we need to show that the only way that can happen is if you're close to the uniform distribution. And so let's uh, start by proving that it can only happen if you're at least close in L2 norm to the uniform distribution. So step two. So let me just, let me sort of switch notation just to, to sort of have fewer letters for a second. Uh, so just in general, suppose you have uh, a distribution P on omega and Q equals uniform on omega. Okay, so for S, omega is this. Okay, script H times capital M. I've just renamed it for a second. And um, 
now what we want to do, let's compute the L2 norm as a function of the collision probability of P. Okay? Because we know we have a bound on this. We want to have a bound on distance to Q. And so actually what I, what I want to do is... Okay, so remember we're now interpreting these probability distributions as vectors indexed by omega. Okay, when we talk about norms or distances. So let's actually do the norm, two norm squared. So this is just sum over uh, everything in omega. P omega minus Q omega squared. And now expanding. Okay, so what I'm doing right now has no content. Okay, so that's just a little bit of uh, mechanical stuff. But now let's see what we got. Okay, and actually what we got, all of these terms we can interpret really easily. Okay, that's why I did this computation. Uh, let's start with this one. So what's this? Again, the notation's changed a couple times, but if you can keep track of it, this is something we know and love. So that's just the collision probability. Okay, so remember before we were saying, you know, sum over the range elements of the probability that the random variable takes on that value. And again, is, is it clear what I mean here? So, so P here is just a vector indexed by omega, where the components are the probability mass that this distribution puts on that particular little omega. Okay? So in other words, it's just the probability that a random variable with this distribution takes on that particular value. Okay, so before we had sum over I, probability that X equals I, this is exactly the same thing, just a notation switch. All right? So this is the collision probability. So collision probability of distribution P. Don't forget Q is not any old distribution. Q is the uniform distribution. Okay? So what we're doing is we're doing a computation which becomes unusually easy for us because we're comparing ourselves to the uniform distribution. That's the point of this. Okay? So if Q is uniform, what does this wind up being? Well, what's each term, right? So what's Q, right? If it's uniform, then each Q is one over the size of omega. So that squared is one over the size of omega squared. And there's omega, cardinality of omega terms, okay? So this is just gonna be one over cardinality of omega. So this is a two here. So, and now once again, this also becomes very easy, this final term, because Q is uniform. Okay? Every single Q is equal to one over the cardinality of omega. So we can just bring that out in front of the sum. Now we sum over the mass of P over omega, that's of course equal to one, because it's a probability distribution. Okay? So this last term is just minus two over omega. Okay. So the norm, the squared two norm, and this of course is exactly why we're doing this intermediary step for the two norm, is because everything just magically becomes simple. The squared two norm is just this stuff. Okay, collision probability of the non-uniform distribution minus the reciprocal of the size of the set that you're talking about. Now for us, you know, what are all these things mean for us? So omega for us is the hash functions times the buckets, that product space, and the collision probability bound, the distribution we care about, is what we computed in step one. Okay? So this first term, these p's, that's just where we concluded step one. And now our omega is just the size of script h times the size of m. Okay? So for us, what we proved is that the squared, so don't forget, we had a square at the beginning the whole time. So the squared two norm, or let's say squared, yeah, uh, squared L2 distance between us and uniform is at most, let's bring it up here. minus one over cardinality of H times cardinality of M. That actually will just cancel this term. Right? So 
I'm combining these, I get a minus one over omega, and that exactly kills off this. So equals one over the cardinality of h times k. Okay? And thinking about it, this makes perfect sense, right? Because at the end of step one, we said, well, what would things look like if we were uniform? Well, the k wouldn't be there, okay? And so what we get in step two, when it could be distance to uniform, you'd sort of expect to get zero, right? So that's what we're getting here, right? So the fact that our collision probability differs from that of what uniform distribution by this one over k is just showing up in that our L2 squared distance to uniform uh, is one over the number of hash functions times k, okay? All right. So now step three is just to go from the two norm to the one norm. That's something we've done before. So for example, when we were talking about uh, compressive sensing, we had to understand a few things about how much bigger the one norm could be than the two norm. And uh, I'm gonna ask you to recall from that discussion that if you're in d-dimensional space, and you have any vector v, Okay, so the one norm can only be bigger than the two norm, but it can only be bigger by a root d factor. Okay, and it's tight when you have all equal entries, like the all ones vector. Okay. Um, right. So again, the one norm for a fixed vector, the one norm is going to be bigger, but the extent to which it's bigger is maximized with all equal components. Okay, so that's going to be root d and d dimensions. Now for us, what's our dimension? Well, remember, our vectors here are just indexed by hash function bucket pairs. Okay, so for us, d is just the cardinality of h times the cardinality of m. Okay, we already computed the L2 norm, specifically L2 norm squared, that was at most one over script uh, cardinality of h times k. So for us, um, L1 distance to uniform So let's uh, take the two norm. So remember this is the two norm squared. So we get to take the square root of that times the square root of the dimension, which again, for us, cardinality of h times cardinality of m. The h's cancel. m over k. All right. So remember, we're just doing the t equals one special case of the main theorem. So that's why Okay, so there's still sort of a slight discrepancy because there's just one half, but recall um, epsilon closeness corresponds to L1 distance to epsilon. That's one of the things I'm going to ask you to prove on the homework. So that's why, you know, with t equal one, that's why you have an extra one half here that you don't have here. Okay, but otherwise that's it. So L1 distance to uniform most square root m over k for t equals one. And again, there's this induction on the homework which says it's not just true, not just this 89 result is true just for a single random data source, but anytime you have a, a block sequence with entropy at, most, at least k, again, that means even condition on everything you've inserted so far, you still have a sufficiently diffuse distribution of what's left, meaning collision probability at most one over k conditionally. That's enough to get you epsilon close, as long as k is uh, at least like triple the amount of entropy that you need. Any final questions? Okay, see you Monday.